Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. I will now begin with um, with the presentation. As Carlos said, uh, we're going to view the fundamentals conceptually and practically of the locking detection technique and a brief uh, introduction to its application to solar cell characterization. Um, okay, let's begin. So this is the outline of the presentation. First, I will briefly review what is noise, or, uh, what we consider noise in electrical measurements and how we can characterize it. Um, this would lead us to answer the question, why do we want to use a locking amplifier? Um, and after that, uh, we'll get to the main um, part at the core of the presentation, which is uh, an introduction to the locking operation and the various um, key concepts that uh, we have to, that I would like you to, to learn because they are very useful when, when utilizing a locking. Um, then we will move to um, see how a locking uh, looks like um, through some pictures of a commercial example. Uh, uh, by this stage, I'm sure that you all will be able to recognize all the buttons, uh, the many buttons that the locking amplifier has, because we already explained um, all the important concepts before. Um, and finally, we'll move to the use of locking for solar cell characterization and the example, as Carlos was saying, of the quantum, quantum efficiency. Finally, I will very briefly summarize the key points of the presentation. So let's begin with uh, noise in electrical measurements. So in signal theory, signal treatment, um, signal is defined as a function that conveys information about the behavior or attributes of some physical phenomenon. Um, conversely, noise is defined as unwanted modification to this function um, uh, in which, uh, which the signal may suffer during its capture, storage, transmission, processing, or conversion. With these two uh, parameters defined, um, we can define a ratio, which is the S and R, the signal to noise, to noise ratio, which is merely um, the ratio between the power of the signal over the power of the noise. Or also sometimes it can be defined as the ratio between the voltage, the amplitude of the voltage uh, of the signals, the signal and the voltage of the noise. So a good quality signal that we can easily measure will have a high SNR. The signal will be higher than the noise. And a signal which is difficult to measure would be that in which the signal is uh, buried inside the noise. The noise is, is very large. So let's see what kind of um, electrical noise we can encounter in, the, in our measurements. Mainly, we can divide it in two types. First one, um, I will call it direct external noise, which is produced by noise sources found in our environment, which is usually the laboratory in which we are working. Um, they are mainly asynchronous, meaning that they do not occur at the reference frequency and we will um, see this concept uh, of reference frequency a lot uh, further on in the, inter in the presentation. Uh, as an example, there are motors, radios, uh, computer screens, or any other lab equipment that can cause this um, external noise to our measurements. Um, the good thing about this noise is, just, is that in most cases it can be reduced, it can be avoided, just by simply by following good lab practices. Uh, the first and most obvious is reduce the source of noise. If you know what's causing the noise, just remove it from the lab or turn it off. And then um, ground all the measuring equipment of your experiment and the device under, under test to the same physical point. So you can avoid um, most of the ground uh, noise loops. Um, also enclose the experiment in an electromagnetic shielding and finally, uh, it is recommended to use short cables and fix them so that they cannot vibrate, they cannot move to avoid uh, this mechanically induced um, noise. Now let's uh, take a look at the intrinsic noise, which is much more interesting and is uh, a noise that is inherent to the physical processes that occur during our measurement. Because it is inherent to these physical processes, it is unavoidable, unlike the uh, external noise. 
but the fact that it is unavoidable does not mean that we don't have uh, we don't have mechanisms to try to minimize its effects. So that's why it's important to know where it comes from and what does it look like. So um, there are different types of intrinsic noise. One is called Johnson noise, also thermal noise, <coughs> which is present in all resist resistors and is due to thermal fluctuations uh, in the electron density of a resistor. Um, you can see uh, the equation um, there of uh, voltage noise, which is, um, as, as you can see, it's dependent on the temperature, the value of the resistance, and then the bandwidth of the signal. So, because it's only dependent of the temperature and the value of the resistance, it is the same in any resistor, no matter, um, no matter uh, of what's the material in which it is um, fabricated. Also, we have the shot noise, also called uh, current noise, which is due to non-uniformity um, in the electron flow. It means that the electrons, uh, when a current is produced, the electrons do not flow continuously, but instead they come um, in, in discrete packages. So this noise is only dependent on the current uh, that we are measuring. So again, it doesn't depend on, on our material. These two kinds of noises, Johnson and Schott noise, are white, also called Gaussian noises. And it means um, that the, the, noise, um, the, power, the noise power density, it means how much power, how much noisy power there is at a particular frequency, is constant. No matter in which range, in which, uh, range of frequency we are working, these two noises have the same um, noise power density. There is a third kind of noise, um, which is the 1 over f noise, also called as flicker or pink noise. This one is due to fluctuations in the resistance of a resistor as current flows through it. And this one is different depending on which uh, resistor we are talking about, but anyhow, it is present in all the resistors. It is called 1 over f noise, because as you can see, uh, the spectral power uh, density of the noise um, has a um, 1 over f um, shape and uh, is decreasing as we increase the frequency uh, of work. So it, this noise is very high at zero frequencies, I mean, at frequencies close to zero, um, but it's, it's being reduced and almost eliminated at very high frequencies. Finally, we can uh, define our total noise as the square root of the sum of the squares of all the noises. So this um, graph here uh, represents the total noise, the total intrinsic noise of a particular um, electronic, um, um, electronic device, um, which has the 1 over f component, which is dominant at low frequencies, and then the white component, which is dominant at middle to higher uh, to high frequencies. Okay, so this is the typical um, power um, density, spectral power density of the noise. So now that we know a little bit more about the noise that we are going to face in our measurements, why would we, would we like to use a locking? What's the what's the advantage of the locking? So first, let's define what a locking is. And this will give, you, give us a hint on how to analyze its advantages. We can say that the locking makes use of the signal modulation and phase sensitive detection, PSD, in order to achieve very high signal to noise ratio. Why are we talking about modulation? So let's go back to the figure of our uh, power, spectral power density of noise. So imagine that we want to work uh, with the signal. Uh, at a certain, with a certain bandwidth, uh, close to zero frequencies. Then the signal will be uh, affected by the very high uh, 1 over f noise at these low frequencies. If, however, we are able to move our signal of interest to a higher frequency, let's call this FR, then for the same bandwidth of signal, we will be working with much less noise because we will be in the area where the white noise is dominant. Uh, therefore, 
uh, locking uh, technique uses amplitude modulation to um, shift the signal of, uh, of interest from um, DC or very low frequencies to very high um, to very high or high, higher frequencies where the noise is uh, lower. So we want to use modulation in order to work in a zone where the noise is as low as possible. Okay, this is understood. But now the question is, why do you want to use a locking? Why don't you use simply a bandpass filter once that you have your signal in a high frequency range where the noise is low? Well, then let's take a look at what a, uh, a band, band pass filter looks like in terms of its transmission um, transmission uh, curve. So here in this image, you can see um, the transmission curves of uh, different band pass filters centered at the same frequency, which is around here where the pointer is. Um, and first, before analyzing this, let's define um, some parameters. So bandwidth, uh, bandpass filters have a signal bandwidth, D sub S, which is two times um, the frequency uh, FC, which is the frequency of minus 3 dB of transmission. This is 0 0.5. So it means that uh, if we get the transmission curve of our uh, filter, let's take the blue one here, when the transmission is minus 3 dB at both sides, if we take this uh, width here, frequency width, this is the signal bandwidth of uh, our bandpass filter. You can see that this signal bandwidth is very large in the green or the red curves, and it goes smaller for the blue and this yellow one, which is here, it's almost, um, I mean, we cannot see it. It's very, very narrow. Um, this um, parameter of the, uh, of the um, signal bandwidth can be related to another parameter, which is the quality factor of the filter, which is basically related to uh, the central frequency and the bandwidth, uh, the signal bandwidth. So the higher this ratio between the central frequency and the signal bandwidth, uh, the narrower our filter is. So the better is filtering the noise because all the all the frequencies that are um, at both sides of the frequency of interest are, are strongly attenuated. So this quality factor Q defines the quality or the effectiveness of our bandpass filter. So the higher it is, the better the filter is. We can also define uh, an equivalent noise bandwidth, which is directly related to uh, the signal bandwidth with this P over 2 factor. Um, uh, obviously, the higher the signal bandwidth, the higher the noise that the filter is letting pass through would be. So if we have a high Q, we'll have a low noise bandwidth. Therefore, we are filtering better our signal. And lastly, we can relate this um, noise bandwidth to another parameter called the effective time constant, which is basically defined as 1 over 2p fc, um, and has this dependence on the, on, the, on the quality factor. We'll talk more about this time constant uh, later on. Um, OK, so in principle, now that we know uh, how a bandpass filter works, one could say, why cannot I use just a simple bandpass filter instead of a locking? Well, the reason is this, that because of practical um, uh, limitations, the maximum uh, Q that can be achieved with an RC or LC bandpass filter is around 100. So we can now go beyond that because of frequency and phase distortions of the filtering. However, when using a locking with a phase sensitive detector, we can reach values of up to 10 to the 8th of um, the parameter Q. And we can do that over a frequency range from 0.001 Hz to 200 megahertz, more or less. So imagine there are two huge advantages of using a locking. The first is the uh, huge increase uh, in, the Q in the quality factor Q. 
which means we are getting rid better of the noise. At the second is that we can use our locking to measure at any frequency um, between this um, high range of frequencies. If we wanted to use uh, bump and filters, we need to design a bump and filter which is able to um, to act at uh, this um, and this high range of frequencies, which is uh, basically very, very expensive. Okay, so this is the theory. Um, let's now put some numbers to it. Let's go to real, to real um, things. Uh, imagine that we want to measure a signal of five nanovolts, which is uh, centered, which is uh, oscillating at a frequency of 10 kilohertz. Now, we want to amplify this signal uh, in order to be able to detect it. So we use a very good uh, low noise amplifier, like the one we have here in the figure, which has a bandwidth of 100 kilohertz, uh, has a gain on 1000, and an input noise of one nanovolt over uh, square um, hertz. So what is the input noise? The input noise of an amplifier is the inherent noise the intrinsic noise of the amplifier because it's uh, made of electrical components, electronic components. And you can see here, extracted from the data sheet of this good low noise amplifier, um, the function of the voltage noise at the input. You can uh, clearly um, detect the 1 over F component and then at frequencies higher than 10 kilohertz, um, the flat uh, power density, which is uh, related to the Gaussian noise. So we use this amplifier to measure our signal, um, and we will have a signal um, um, amplification. So the signal at the output of the amplifier will be 5 microvolts, so 5 nanovolts times 1000, but we're also amplifying the input noise of the amplifier, which will be the input noise at the, the input noise times the gain times the bandwidth, uh, square bandwidth, uh, square root bandwidth at which we are working, which gives us 320 microvolts. And this results in a signal-to-noise ratio of 0 0.016. That means that we cannot measure anything there. Let's now say that we had a very good bandpass filter at the output of our amplifier, uh, which is centered at a frequency 10 kilohertz as our signal, and with a very good quality um, factor of 100. Then if we do the math, we'll get a signal of 5 microvolts again, noise of 10 microvolts, and again a signal-to-noise ratio of 0 0.55, which is still a pretty noisy signal, difficult to accurately measure. If we use a PSD, a locking, then we can easily get uh, narrow the bandwidth uh, of transmission up to down to 0, 0.0 Hz or less, and again, doing the numbers, this with leads with a signal-to-noise ratio of 50, which is 100 times better than with the bandpass filters. And now we can very accurately uh, measure our signal. Okay, I hope now you are convinced of the powerful um, um, skills of the of the locking. Let's now see how it works. Here, um, I've drawn a simplified block diagram of the locking that we will use a lot during the presentation. Um, basically, you have an input, the input signal that we want to measure, which will be amplified inside the locking. Then we have this thing called mixer of PSD, phase sensitive detector, a stage of low pass filtering, and this is amplification, and finally, this is our output signal. Uh, there is also this um, box called reference trigger, of which we will talk in a few seconds. So let's talk a little bit about the input signal. Um, remember that the locking um, uh, works in a, at a high frequencies, or at least frequencies. Uh, I mean, I mean, with AC signals, not with uh, DC signals. So it means that our input signal has to be already. Uh, oscillating when it gets to the locking. It needs to be uh, modulated at some frequency so that the locking can, can, be, um, can be used. How can we uh, modulate our signal? We can do it electronically, for example, using a function generator or even the own, the own locking um, as a modulator. Or mechanically, for example, in optoelectronics experiments, 
as a quantum efficiency we will see, we can intercept the optical beam uh, with a rotating blade um, called chopper. Okay, so now uh, let's see what's going on, what's happening with our input signal at different stages of the locking. So number one here would be the input signal with this um, a pure sign in this case with an amplitude um, uh, B signal. Um, in number two we have this uh, reference trigger which is um, which is a stage in which a sinusoidal at the reference frequency is generated. Uh, so in number two we have um, this signal which is a sinusoid at uh, another uh, frequency WL uh, at, with an amplitude WL. So the mixture here is nothing more than a multiplier. It multiplies the two signals that are coming into it. So if we do um, the maths here we get that at the output of the mixture we have this signal here which has two components. Uh, you see the minus there uh, which is basically uh, one component at the frequency of the difference of the frequency of the input W uh, omega R and the frequency of the reference omega L and one component here which is uh, at the sum of the two frequencies omega R plus uh, omega L. So what happens if we get uh, omega R, R to be omega L then these terms here uh, the cosine of the difference times t becomes 1 and the whole first term becomes a constant which means that after filtering with the low pass filter the output of the signal will be this constant here and we will get an output which is proportional to the input amplitude uh, w sigma that w uh, signal the rest, the other component of the signal at point 3 at the exit of the mixture which is a cosine at the sum of the frequencies is filtered in the low pass filter and therefore does not come to the output. So any asynchronous noise, asynchronous meaning it doesn't come at the frequency um, of our, um, of our um, reference here will be um, discarded uh, after the low-pass filtering uh, stage. Okay, so the mixer is just a multiplier. We have two sinusoidals and if we get these two sinusoidals to be uh, of the same frequency then the low-pass filter output would be a constant which is proportional to the input signal that we want to measure. Great, so now the only thing we have to do is to make this uh, omega r be equal to omega L. So the frequency of the reference which is triggered by this stage be equal to the reference to the frequency of the input. For that we need another uh, input to the lock-in which, uh, which is going to tell, him, tell it exactly the reference uh, frequency at which, uh, at which the input signal is modulated. By knowing exactly this, uh, at all times, this uh, modulation frequency, the reference trigger can create uh, inside the lock-in uh, another signal at the same frequency uh, so that all the detection systems will work. So we need two inputs into the lock-in. The input signal that we want to measure and the input frequency that we will use to create a reference for the multiplication. So, okay, this is the main concept of uh, why a locking amplifier can get rid uh, of the noise. But wait a minute. What about the phase? We call this all the time phase sensitive detection, but we're not talking about phases at all. So now we can add uh, um, <clears throat> the concept of the phase. You know that both um, sinusoidal signals at the input, at the reference, would come with a particular phase. If we assume already that they are both at uh, the same frequency, then at the output of the mixer, point 3, we'll have again a two-component signal 
this one here, which is a constant, um, which is a constant um, value, uh, which is a, um, related to uh, the signal at the input plus the cosine between the difference of the um, faces at the signal at the signal and at the reference. And then another um, value here, which is again um, an, an AC signal at two times the frequency of the reference, which will be filtered by the low pass filter. So the only signal of interest again is this uh, DC signal that will go through the low pass filter. So now we see that this uh, the signal that we will be measured at point four, it's not only dependent on the frequency but only on the faces of the input and the reference. So that's why we add here this phase shifter stage in order to maximize uh, the output signal. And how do we maximize the output signal? What we do is to make uh, the phase of the reference equals to the phase of the signal so that the cosine will be one and then we recover our DC output which is uh, only dependent on the, the amplitude of, the, of our signal. So just to summarize, we need two inputs. The input signal, which is already modulated. The frequency to create the reference at which the signal is modulated. And then we have to take care of uh, adjusting the shift, uh, adjusting the phase of our reference and our input signal so that the output will be maximized. Okay, I hope uh, that was clear because that's the most important part of the presentation. Um, here uh, we will just uh, see graphically what's going on with our signal in all these phases. So this, is, this will be our output signal which is already modulated and you can see it's a noisy signal. But it's centered at zero um, in this case because um, it's a sinusoidal um, signal with uh, means value zero plus some noise. This signal goes as input to the locking detection module and directly to the mixer um, and also this gives the reference to uh, create the locking module the reference um, signal that also goes to the mixer. So at this point at the output of the mixer we have our demodulated signal which has been multiplied by the reference and you can see now how the mean value is not any, any longer zero. It means we have a DC value out uh, at the output of the PSD. So when we do the low pass filter of this signal, what we get is a constant signal over time, which is actually the amplitude of the um, sinusoidal of the input um, signal. Um, maybe it's easier or it helps a lot to add a frequency domain version of what's going on. So for this, um, you can see here the digital uh, Fourier transfor transforms of all the signals of the previous graph. So this would be the DFT of the input signal, where you can see this peak, which is um, at the frequency of the, of the modulation of the signal. This noise here represents the noise um, at all, the density of uh, noise at all frequencies. And this other peak here is just uh, the replica of this peak in the in the DFT um, shifted by the frequency of sampling. This is not important here. Um, so again, with the reference, we can, the locking can create um, pure sinusoidal signal. Uh, see, there is no noise in this DFT um, at the same frequency as the signal input. And after mixing, uh, what we have is a very strong peak at zero frequency. This is a DC signal, plus a new peak at double the reference frequency. This is the peak that we have um, in the second term of the output of the of the mixture. And after low pass filtering this signal, we basically uh, remain with the DC signal. That is what we want to measure. So. Just let me stop here to uh, say again the key ideas that needs to be retained on the, on the locking operation. A locking uh, amplifier can be considered as a high Q tracking bandpass filter. 
the input signal needs to be modulated at a particular frequency, which we will call the reference frequency, and the PSD can be considered as a special rectifier, this is a converter AC-DC, that rectifies only the signals at the reference frequency, whereas all the rest comes out of the PSD as AC signals that can be filtered by the low pass filter. Okay, let's go now to uh, two key concepts in the locking amplifier operation <coughs> that will be very useful when you decide how to operate your locking. The first one is time constant. This um, concept appeared before in the bandpass filter and it is used uh, traditionally to characterize um, the equivalent nose bandwidth of low pass filters. It is again defined as, we call it tau, it is defined as 1 over 2, P, 2 pi f, uh, fc, where fc is again the frequency at which the transmission falls uh, 3 dB in the low pass filter. And in this case, uh, the equivalent bandwidth noise is 1 over uh, 4t. In the case of the um, bandpass filter, it was 1 over 2t, 2 tau, sorry. So, the higher the values of our tau in our filters result in lower values on bandwidth, of noise bandwidth, and therefore in a higher signal to noise ratio, rate ratio at the output. So, ideally, we want filters with a very high time constant. But nothing comes with a, without a cost. And now we can understand why we will understand why is this name of time constant. Actually, low pass filters require some time to reflect at the output changes at the input. For example, a single um, stage RC filter requires about five time constant to uh, truthfully, faithfully reflect at the output uh, changes in the input. Uh, this means that if we go to get to very um, low values of uh, B sub N, of the noise bandwidth, we have to go to very high values of tau, therefore we have to perform a, a very slow measurements. So this is always this trade-off. In locking amplifiers, low-pass filters are uh, C, um, have a C decibel CDB uh, per octave roll-off. It means that after the frequency FC, uh, the, the transmission uh, the transmission slope goes down uh, with uh, the transmission goes down with a slope of six decibel per octave of frequency, and there are typically two to four successive uh, filter stages, so that the overall roll-off uh, can be from 12 to 24 uh, decibel um, per octave. Another very important concept is that of dynamic reserve. Um, so for this, to explain this, let's uh, draw again uh, some part of the uh, <coughs> diagram of the locking amplifier, where here I added uh, two letters, D sub 1 and D sub 2, which represents the gain at the, uh, respectively at the AC amplification and DC amplification stages. Why do we have to amplify with the locking? Because we want to measure very, very small uh, signals down to nanovolts. So we need to amplify them in order to be uh, easily detected at the output. So there are these two stages of amplification, G G1 for the AC and G2 for the DC. Now, the important thing to uh, keep in mind is that the DC amplification comes after the low pass filtering and the mixing. Um, and all these, uh, all these um, uh, stages, especially the mixing, it may introduce noise. So if we amplify, um, so every amplification that we do at the output will also include or will be amplifying the noise induced by the mixer and also the noise induced by the uh, amplifier itself, the input noise that we were um, talking about at the beginning of the presentation. However, the gain G sub 1 is amplifying only the input signal, so will only amplify the intrinsic noise of our signal and the noise of our um, amplifier, which in principle would be smaller than, um, than the loss of the signal if it's a noisy signal. So we can define dynamic reserve now as the ratio 
of the largest tolerable noise signal to the full scale signal. Now, uh, what is a tolerable noise signal? It means, well, there is some controversy in this definition, but basically it means uh, the noise signal uh, which comes with the input signal that will make our uh, locking amplifier to saturate or to uh, present a very noisy output, so a not, uh, not trustworthy uh, measurement. The full scale signal is basically the input signal that will saturate any uh, of the um, of the stages of our um, uh, locking amplifier, and it's basically dependent on the um, sensitivity scale that we choose for our locking. So this is quite technical concept, but the idea uh, to be kept in mind is that the dynamic reserve is how much noise we allow at the input uh, with respect to our signal. So how big can the noise be? in order for the locking to function properly. So, in principle, one would, what we think that uh, as, uh, it would be better to allow as much noise as possible because that way we can, um, we can uh, measure signals which, have, uh, more, more, which are more noisy. But let's take a look at what happens when we uh, work with different dynamic reserves. So in the dynamic reserve, uh, when we use low dynamic reserve or the low noise mode, mode of the locking amplifier, we're using high values of G1 and low values of G2. It means that our input signal is amplified as maximum, and then the output noise will be dominated and limited by the intrinsic noise of the signal. So this is actually the way in which we would like to measure, because uh, we will only be affected by the input, noise, the input noise of the signal, of which we cannot get rid of. However, if the input noise is very, uh, is very high, we cannot use this high uh, G1 amplification because the AC amplifier will saturate. Then we have to go to high reserve mode, in which the locking uh, is going to use uh, low uh, G1, low AC amplification to avoid the overload of the, of the amplifier and high G2 uh, amplification in order to have a measurable output signal. Uh, sorry for this uh, small um, mistake in the presentation. I think this is a double thing. Um, so um, the, there is a problem with this high reserve uh, mode, uh, which is that uh, it is affected by some, some noise sources that were not present in the, or were negligible in the low noise operation. One very important source of noise is the nonlinearity of the PSD here, which output, uh, the output of the multiplication, if it's analog, analog, analog mixture, it's uh, dependent on the magnitude. It's not totally linear and it uh, varies with the, um, with the magnitude of the input signal. So, for very um, low input signals, we may have some non-linearities non that actually uh, create a trans a result in noise of the output. Another source of uh, problems is the DC offset that present both the mixer and the DC amplifier. These uh, two stages come out with uh, a small DC offset that uh, could be negligible in principle, but uh, when it is very highly amplified by the high gain of G2, this offset it can be uh, can result in um, modification, uh, in DC modification of the output signals, and therefore an erroneous or a somewhat erroneous measurement. And also, this low pass filter, as uh, as narrow as we can make it, it will be letting uh, pass through it low frequency noise. Uh, if we have a very, um, a very uh, high G2 amplification, this low frequency noise will be also amplified and may uh, perturb the, the signal that we want to measure. So again, we'll distort the output signal. So what we want to do, if possible, is to place our locking in a low dynamic reserve mode um, using the low noise configuration but if the signal is too noisy, then we will not be able to do this and we'll have to move to a high dynamic reserve mode to allow more, more um, 
noise at the input, uh, just knowing that it may cause some troubles at the at the output. Okay, let's uh, see now uh, a few aspects of the evolution of the locking amplifiers. Locking amplifiers used to be analog, but nowadays um, they are all the new lockings are uh, digital. And let's see some advantages and some changes from the analog to the digital digital uh, locking amplifier. So in the analog analog PSD, the analog reference is a sine wave. The locking the function generation of the locking generates an analog analog sinusoidal wave. However, in the digital PSD, um, the input uh, signal uh, is uh, converted um, after amplification, after the AC amplification, is converted uh, with an AD converter to digital, usually using a depth of uh, 16 bits. So, in the, some problems of the analog PSD, is that the overall gain uh, is susceptible to amplitude drift. This is that, uh, especially under changes in temperature, um, the, the um, amplitude of the reference sign can change or can have some, can have some drift, and this will affect, affect the overall drift, uh, the overall uh, gain, sorry, in our um, locking amplifier, and will, will result in an um, error in the output uh, measurement. However, because it's a digital wave, the amplitude never changes in the digital PSD, so there are no these um, uh, amplitude drifts. Also, the PSD, uh, the analog PSD, as we were mentioning, had some uh, error due to PSD output offset. So there is always a small output offset at the output of the PSD. This output offset is uh, eliminated by the digital multiplication of the digital uh, PSD. So again, we get rid of this problem. And finally, because of this nonlinearity in the analog PSDs, the dynamic reserve is limited to about 60 dB. dB. Uh, so we cannot allow we, noises uh, um, 60 dB higher than uh, the signal uh, to be measured are not allowed. However, uh, with an AD conversion, um, the, the, um, the AD conversion is a process which is extremely linear, meaning that this, um, the conversion is equally um, precisely done with low and very high um, signals, and it's totally accurate. So uh, the dynamic reserves don't suffer from this um, nonlinearity problem and can reach and exceed values of 100 decibels. So these are all the advantages of a di digital uh, PSD in compared to an analog, analog PSD. Uh, finally, uh, let's talk about the uh, dual phase locking amplifiers. Very quickly, uh, let's assume that um, we have uh, first uh, PSD, PSD1, which have uh, this equation here, um, and um, and let uh, let call it uh, theta the difference in phase between the signal and the reference. Then the voltage at the output of the PSD uh, one will be, as we saw before, uh, proportional to the amplitude of the signal times the cosine of this uh, phase difference. If we add a second PSD which is shifted 90 degrees from the first one, um, then uh, the output of the PSD will be um, proportional again to the voltage of the signal, but this time to the sign of the different in phases. And now if we define X and Y, and these two um, parameters here, um, X be uh, the amplitude of the signal times the cosine and Y times the sine, then we can define R, which is the um, Sorry, this is the square root of the r square is x square plus uh, y square, and uh, will be always uh, that uh, v signal. So by adding a second PSD, we will have, which is shifted from the first one, we have two signals, two output signals out of these two PSD, which are, um, which is one proportional to the cos and one proportional to the sine, and these allow us always and immediately to um, detect. A v signal independent on which is the uh, phase shift of uh, our reference with compared to uh, the input signal. So the x um, the x signal is called the in-phase component and the y the in-quadrative component. 
and um, the phase difference between the reference and the signal can be uh, calculated as the inverse uh, tangential of um, um, the y over x. So by including a dual phase uh, a dual phase locking by including a second PSD does not require phase tracking, does not require to, maxim to maximize the output by changing the phase of the PSD, I can directly measure x, y, r, and theta. Okay, let's go now um, to see what the locking uh, looks like in commercial examples. So there are four different lockings that what can uh, acquire um, today. This is an analog, analog, analog one. These uh, are uh, digital versions, of different brands. And I will do uh, now, um, I will continue the presentation with the Stanford Research 830 for the only reason that uh, I had one by hand and I'm used to it, not for any other particular reason. Um, so this is how it, how it looks like. And you see it has a lot of bottom here and some displays. But now, uh, I'm sure that if you uh, took a closer look to the locking, you could um, identify which all these bottoms and lights uh, mean. And that's what we are going to do very quickly. Uh, first, let me tell you, let me show you uh, the real uh, functional block diagram of this uh, locking amplifier that you can perfectly understand now. This is uh, the input uh, signal that will be amplified in IC. These are just two uh, notch filters to eliminate uh, the, um, the electrical, um, the line frequency and the double of the line frequency. Um, plus um, some gain here. Um, then uh, we have the input for the reference um, frequency and an oscillator which is uh, generating our reference signal. This reference signal can be sifted by the safe shifter and multiplied to the uh, input signal that comes through this wire in this PSD. But also this uh, generated uh, sign uh, is shifted 90 degrees to the inquadrature component that will be multiplied also to the, um, to the input signal, the amplified input signal. Um, then we have two uh, stages of low pass filtering at the output of the two PSDs and again the digital amplification at the output of the low pass filter. And these are just, um, uh, the cal this is just a calculation of R and theta and uh, the outputs that we can uh, we can read in the screens of the locking of y, x, r, and zeta. Um, okay. So uh, let's take a closer look at the, the interface of the locking. Um, this part we can see uh, the word reference here. So this is the part handling the the reference signal because and and which should be uh, plugged into this reference uh, in input because it is not plugged in the locking is say that it is not uh, locked to any uh, to any reference uh, signal so it will not be able to act as a locking and detect any any signal that we want if however now we plug our um, reference uh, signal to the input now the unlock um, warning has disappeared and we can detect 180 Hertz which is the signal in this case at which an optical chopper is rotating. But we can also um, decide to work with the locking as an internal reference generator so in this case it doesn't require any uh, input. Actually it has an output um, uh, port through which we can uh, take an output of this internally generated frequency and here we can see that we are generating um, a, a sign which is written here. It could also be um, a square wave, wave uh, with positive or negative edge. We are generating a sign at 1.1 kilohertz and 1.2 volts. So in this part, uh, in this right hand part of the locking, we can um, decide um, 
uh, which reference, if it's internal or external, and we can decide how the external reference will be. If we go to the left hand side, here we can play with the sensitivity, um, sorry, with the time constant of the low pass filter of the locking. This can be selected to be one second, but it can go uh, by many order of magnitude. This is the slope of the filters. In this case, it's 24 dB per octave filters. Um, these are the LEDs uh, signaling overload at the input and the sensitivity um, uh, of the locking. Um, then uh, this is the dynamic reserve, which can be high reserve, low noise, as we saw, of a middle uh, st um, intermediate stage, which is normal. The signal input would be connected here um, in A or AB um, uh, ports. And these are the filters for uh, the line and the harmonic of the line that we saw in the block diagram. And finally, these are the displays of the locking that can show, as in this case, the value of R and theta. You can see here 28 degrees, minus 28 degrees, and 4 microvolts. Or you can show the values of X and Y, in this case, both displays and showing uh, microvolts. So just one appreciation. When we are talking about volts, what does it mean? What does the locking uh, actually reads? So if we go back to uh, uh, signal uh, theory, um, according to Fourier theorem, any signal can be represented by the sum of a certain number up to infinity, uh, up to infinite, sorry, number of sine waves of different amplitudes and frequencies. So if at the input we don't have a perfectly sinusoidal signal, only if a spectral component the spectral component at the frequency of interest will be measured, that we all know. Um, let's keep this in mind. Now, another thing is that, in general, locking displays uh, the value RMS of voltage. But you should check your own locking before uh, being sure about this. Uh, so for a sinusoidal wave, this value RMS is equal to the peak-to-peak -peak voltage uh, divided by around 2.8. It means that if at the input of the locking, we have this sinusoidal with peak to peak value of V sub i. At the output, um, we will have um, this um, this uh, value of V sub y over uh, uh, 2.8. Sorry. Now imagine that the input we have a square signal of value V sub i. Then at the output, we will have V sub i times 2.8, uh, sorry, over 2.8 times 1.27. Where does this 1.27 come from? Well, this is actually the first component of the Fourier transform of the square wave, which is kind of uh, uh, drafted here, uh, which is of higher amplitude than the, um, than the square uh, wave itself. So because the locking only um, detects uh, the signals at the reference frequency, it's going to be detecting this uh, first uh, first component at, the, at um, the reference frequency of the signal, um, of the signal, uh, square signal. So just uh, be careful of what uh, signals you're measuring, because in this case, shape matters for the output of the locking amplifier if you're measuring um, RMS. Okay, let's uh, move uh, very quickly to the last part of the presentation, the use of locking for solar cell characterization and the example of quantum efficiency. Um, so as you all know, quantum efficiency is the number of electrons per incident photon. Um, and what we need to measure it is a monochromatic light source, an amperimeter, and the calibrated detector. Um, so the locking uh, comes in place as uh, acting of amperimeter for, very, um, for noisy measurements which can be caused by uh, different reasons, weak like intensity, weak device response, high noise uh, device, and in all these cases the lockings will be very useful. Just as an example, here I show you an image of a quantum efficiency that uh, has been measured varying in more than seven orders of magnitude uh, using a locking amplifier. So just um, to see how powerful uh, this technique is. Um, this is um, one example of a quantum efficiency setup with the lamp, um, the chopper, um, which will be connected 
to the locking amplifier, um, the monochrome actor, the set of filters, and uh, a couple of mirrors, and here is with the and uh, here is where the um, uh, device under test will under test will be. Okay, so we're going to talk about about uh, about some uh, common errors in the quantum efficiency that may affect the locking detection. Basically, as we will see later, focusing of the filters and the chopper. Um, okay, so this measurement is conceptually very simple, but it's actually quite uh, difficult to perform um, accurately. Probably the most difficult part is um, to characterize properly the light source, but we're going not to tackle this today. We will uh, talk about the problems that may affect the proper locking detection of our signal. So for this, we have to take care of the modulated the light which is modulated by the chopper. The other uh, sources of noise uh, will be, in principle, eliminated by the locking. So that's why we will um, talk about the placement of the chopper, which is the modulating tool, and the adequacy of optical filters. Now, uh, the problem with the with the to be the, the thing to be care taken care about with the chopper is that um, all light that goes through or that bounces back at the dark parts is modulated at the at the reference frequency and therefore can be detected erroneously uh, uh, for the locking as a signal. So it is very important to avoid underside light to reach the chopper, either to go through it or to bounce back. So if possible, use an in-house chopper, like this one at the right, that will block most of the light, except the light that is placed at the input, um, to go through it or back, bounce back on it. Now, uh, even if you have a covered, an in-house or not, um, um, chopper, um, there is um, an issue of where to place it. So the best place to place the chopper is uh, behind, before the monochromator, here, between the light and monochromator, and not here between monochromator and the dot. This is because if any spurious light comes through the chopper or bounces back at the chopper, it will have to go then through the monochromator and filters in order to reach the dot, the DOT. So at least, we are guaranteeing that this light uh, is at the wavelength of interest that we are measuring at this moment. However, if the chopper is between the monochromator and the DUT, then light that reflects uh, is reflected in the chopper and goes to the DUT can have any wavelength uh, besides um, the desired wavelength of the monochromator. So this is the right way of placing the chopper. And finally, for the optical filters, um, this, uh, we have to study a little bit the output of the monochromator. This would be to the, um, the ideal output of a monochromator with just the desired wavelength and the selective wavelength at the output. But in reality, we have a different output which contains high order diffraction beams or so harmonics of this um, wavelength and also contains some stray light which is a background noise, uh, optical noise of all wavelengths. So the best thing uh, in order to avoid all this optical noise and undesired light is to use bandpass filtering center at the frequency center of the wavelength of, uh, of the selective wavelength of the monochromator. However, this is not always possible or practical if we need to uh, do a measurement in a very large uh, range of wavelengths. So another solution is to use ideal long pass, fil uh, long pass filters, which ideally have this uh, shape like this in order to uh, allow only um, the light at the desired wavelength and cut all the light, cut off all the light at uh, smaller wavelengths. Uh, so the golden rule to be taken, uh, um, to be um, kept, kept in mind with these long path filters is that they can be used only between the, the, cut, the cut off wavelength of the filter and two times the cut-off wavelength of the filter. Because if, you use the, if we use them for longer wavelengths, then we fall into this problem that the filter, which is used uh, in the measurement of this selected um, wavelength uh, in the bidimensional is actually uh, letting pass some of, some of the harmonics or the first harmonic of the wavelength. So it will give you, uh, we will get an erroneous uh, measurement. 
And just to finalize, I would uh, like to um, show you these measurements in which uh, this is the same measurement of quantum efficiency uh, done with a, performed with a 1,000 um, 1, um, nanometer long pass filter, uh, which is starting at 1,000 nanometers, and then a 1,200 nanometer long pass filter, which starts to act at 1,200 nanometers. And we see that with a 1,000 nanometer filter, we're getting any, some signal which is actually uh, not present when we use the 1200 nanometer filter. But in principle, the 1000 nanometer filter should go up to, should be able, we should be able to use it up to 12,000 nanometer filter before it allows the presence of um, secondaries. So what's going on here? The problem is that filters are not ideal. They are real and not so abrupt. So actually, they allow some uh, transmission of at wavelengths uh, smaller than the cutoff wavelength. So this makes that even if we don't reach this limit of uh, wavelength twice the cutoff wavelength of the filter, we may be uh, letting pass um, some secondaries that are a shorter wavelength. So it's very important, this example is to tell you that it's very important to always carefully check the transmission data provided by the manufacturer for your filter and also to perform uh, your own characterization of the filters, extending the explore range in order not to fall um, into traps like this. Just to summary the presentation, um, the, the inherent electrical noise is unavoidable and may give rise to very low signal to noise ratios of a signal to be measured. Uh, locking amplifiers achieve very high noise rejection and large increase uh, in the signal to noise ratio by phase locking detection to a particular frequency. This uh, locking detection includes different stages such as amplification, mixing, and filtering. And understanding of the key concepts such as dynamic reserve or time constants allow us to optimize the conditions of a particular measurement. And finally, locking amplifier is a very powerful tool in semiconductor solar cell characterization, for example, in quantum efficiency measurements. This is some biography that I found very interesting and uh, I recommend to all of you. And 